20% were unsure and 20% said no. Today, we're joined by Hong Kong veteran Chip Sao, who has used his satirical skills to tackle tough issues like government corruption and corporate malfeasance for more than 30 years. His career has not been without controversy. His outspoken and often irreverent commentary has drawn criticism, and he has faced legal threats, censorship, and even physical harassment for his writing. Chip will talk to us about lessons from his career and the potential of satire as a journalistic tool. That's the briefing. Let's begin. On this conversation, Chip said, we're going to be as unpolitically correct as we can. So um, that sets the bar. There's another sort of note that I would like to make amongst friends and family. I'm not known as the funny person. I know there have been a lot of social media posts with funny emojis. That one is not me. I'm setting the bar low, so you can be very kind and laugh at any jokes I make. All the pressure is now on Chip to be funny, <laughs> witty, and make the point about satire, which is a great and comfortable way for me to kick off. Chip, thank you for joining in, first of all. Um, you were based in Hong Kong for the lo longest time. Home is now Oxford. Let's start with a little bit of the why around satire and why you chose to pick it and what drew you to it? Well, uh, I, was brought, I was born and brought up in Hong Kong and I came to this country to um, further my studies uh, in my, with my A-levels and then uh, followed by a degree in English literature and Warwick. That was early, in the early 1980s. And subsequently, I was um, fortunate enough to... Uh, uh, to be able to get a job from the BBC World Service for uh, a, an eight year long uh, journalistic or professional or broadcasting career there. I would say an English degree helps very much uh, for me to mold my uh, character as I appear to be now with, because um, English literature is such a, a treasure land of satires and humor and wits, right, and et cetera, express, well expressed in, uh, in Shakespeare's work, from Shakespeare to Dryden, Alexander Pope, um, George Orwell, you know, Oscar Wilde, and you, well, Oscar Wilde, and you name it. So, and uh, I grew up, I went to the university, and I, 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 uh, I, I got into the BBC World Service during the 1980s. That was a time when Britain was in its heyday of economic uh, prosperity, brought by what someone might remember um, favorably or unfavorably, Thatcherism. And uh, it was a heyday of, uh, of uh, creativity as well. Uh, at that time, in, as far as the BBC or ITV uh, 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 is concerned, you had the... Um, um, the, the split image, right? And uh, you had um, uh, Mr. Bean, well, Rowan Atkinson's uh, Black Adders, you know, the comic, uh, the comedy series. Uh, you had Benny Hill Show, uh, a bit of uh, Austin Power, uh, the, uh, you know, outrageous uh, comedian. And, um, and uh, I remember when I first came, I loved to watch the, a series called um, Mind Your Language. It was uh, starred by uh, a, a, a an English teacher, age, yes, Barry Evan, <laughs> in a classroom teaching a crowd of uh, English language students from yeah. all, all over the world. There was an Indian, a Pakistani, Italian, Greek, you know, Chinese or Japanese, and you name it. And the producer and the script writer did play with uh, all sort of uh, politically incorrect uh, comical stunts so outrageously and perfectly, making fun of uh, people's accent and um, and uh, rigid or all sort of funny behavior or reaction to the teaching of English language. Yes. At that time, it was loudest everywhere. And uh, as a as a as an Asian, as a, as a student uh, from Hong Kong. I mean, someone asked me, what do, you, what, what do I feel about it? What do I feel about it? I said, you, well, I mean, I wouldn't say it's an, it's, I wouldn't say it's an, a realistically 100% accurate representation of the Hong Kong Chinese or, 
or foreigners, but it's good fun. Yes. You know, so long as you know it's good fun, so long as you don't take it seriously, so long as you're able to tell uh, how human weaknesses and follies are sufficiently exposed in these comedies, it's good fun and let's have a good laugh. And Britain, as we all know, is the cradle of a sense of humor. You know, when you said um, people may or may not remember, I thought you were referring to economic prosperity, but uh, it seemed like you were talking about Thatcherism. So yes. we're clear about that one. Uh, let me jump to the here and now, where in a recent article I read that you identified yourself as, when asked who you would compare yourself as, you said, well, probably Tucker Carlson or Piers Morgan. I want to be clear <laughs> and double check whether that was satire. A, a cocktail of Tucker Carlson and Piers Morgan of, I'm making up uh, about uh, 60%, but I'd rather have 40% of Andrew Ma, right? <laughs> you know, uh, um, and a bit of a Stephen Fry as well, of a Cantonese version, you know. <laughs> uh, Carlson Tucker, somehow, he, he's, he, he's going a little bit too far, you know, okay. as far That's as his case. enthusiasm and over-enthusiastic passion for all the fake news created uh, during the, uh, the, the, the previous uh, American presidential election, you know, monitored by Donald Trump and his followers, you know. They did go, you know, a little bit too far. So I... I, I'm glad to make a bit of a revision you know, mm. of my cocktail composition, of the cocktail composition of my so-called uh, Chip Chow brand of the uh, Hong Kong uh, satire and humor. Right? How has um, life changed for the Chip Chow brand of humor in terms of the fact that you took a conscious decision to move out of Hong Kong? Yes. I imagine there were political and other imperatives that, uh, I, to make that yes, I what spent changed? yes, I spent altogether sixteen years in Britain, and I left this country in, in nineteen ninety three when John Major came into power, and at that time I thought there were some exciting years lying ahead as Chris Batten took up the job of uh, uh, the last governorship in Hong Kong, so there would be another five golden final uh, last five golden years of British colonialism. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, uh, on that horizon, if the curtain, the final curtain was about to be uh, uh, to be drawn, right? right? So, I mean, I was young enough to dare to uh, uh, go back to Hong Kong because at that time nobody knew what was uh, lying ahead after 1997. Uh, Patton did a, a very brave job. Uh, however, you know, I know he was uh, a bit of a controversial figure here in uh, at home. Uh, still, I think he was uh, he made himself a great politician and uh, also a, a great defender of uh, liberty, values like liberty and uh, and um, democracy there. But for a good twenty five years, things were about okay because right after nineteen ninety seven. Uh, or shortly before the handover, Deng Xiaoping died, and his protege from Shanghai, Jiang Zemin, took power. And Jiang, when Jiang Zemin took power, uh, China and Hong Kong enjoyed a good twenty years of um, of uh, um, um, financial financial bubbling prosperity, because uh, Jiang Zemin uh, was a you know was a fake communist. He believed in the, 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 the crudest form of capitalism with nepotism uh, and he didn't mind the party corruption and he did everything to make his friends and relatives rich and uh, he put up uh, a, a great show to, uh, uh, to, to mislead a few American presidents from Clinton to George Bush into uh, admitting China into the WTO. You know, and then he created such a great Cinderella party for China and for the rest of the world, for America. You know, so uh, at that time we were under the when we were under the impression that the party would go on forever. And Jiang Zemin was born in 1926. He went to university in Shanghai in the late 1940s, before the communists took over. It was the Shanghai Jiao Tong University founded by American missionaries where he studied 
physics engineering and electrical engineering, and he was a man of uh, of a limited letters. He could recite uh, the Gettysburg uh, uh, um, uh, speech by uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln, and he could sing some broken uh, pieces of uh, Italian, also Lemieux, or that sort of things. And there, he made himself, uh, he put himself at the center of the stage of uh, China Chinese diplomacy. Uh, shortly before and after the millennium year. At that time, we all thought, I think the rest of the world did as well. China as a uh, middle class was, uh, was uh, developing uh, uh, with uh, 3,000 years Confucian uh, cultures, you know, and uh, would stand a good chance of uh, merging into the mainstream of uh, globalization, if not civilization, right? So Jiang Zemin died, and then we had this uh, uh, chairman, Jinping, you know, or President Xi, and then the story, the storyline changed a bit, and the rest is history or is uh, current affairs now. What does it mean for the world of satire? Um, has it become, and, and let me sort of, uh, well, you know, add a few layers to that question. Do you feel it's become more blunt? As a tool, mm. there was a round of laughter amongst the audience when, uh, you know, the poll showed that people think it's not as useful as it should be yes. because it, it sort of draws attention towards fake news. Is that a problem? Wow. And I think, you know, the other part of this, because you walked us uh, so eloquently through what was happening across yes. China, is there a cultural context to it? Is it possible to do a Charlie Hebdo in, in some wow. countries and not in many others? Very good and complicated uh, question. <laughs> Uh, I have I survived. Put it all in there. I went back to Hong Kong <laughs> shortly before 1997, and then I worked for a newly founded English newspaper called Eastern Express. At the same time, I became a Hong Kong radio weekly uh, cultural talk show, and plus a few jobs from the uh, TV uh, stations there. You know, and uh, as Hong Kong entered the 19, uh, the post 1997 Chinese rule. We uh, sense the atmosphere, despite despite the uh, economic tolerance of Jiang Zemin, right? Uh, we felt the tension uh, in the air or in the atmosphere uh, getting a little bit um, uh, harsher and harsher, right? And the writing was already on the wall, was always on the wall. That means the Chinese or Beijing would not tell you what you can say or what you can't what you can do or what you can't. You know, they are very clever in installing invisible lines. You know, it's just like the kind of uh, science fiction stunt you see in movies like Mission Impossible. You know, when Tom Cruise gets into uh, uh, the headquarters of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of uh, a gangster's headquarters, you know, trying to steal something, you know, there invisible red lines everywhere, you know. So you have to uh, second guess. We all lived in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in, in a time of uh, second guessing, right? So some did not manage to survive, to survive long because they criticized Hong Kong, the, the Chinese government and Jiang Zemin and the Communist Party in the most blatant and straightforward way. And uh, I saw my peers uh, coming into stage and uh, and uh, being told to shut up, and some of them even arrested in China, and some of them uh, uh, bluntly uh, censored uh, into silence. So I was, I think, I was um, smart enough to uh, remember my early English literature uh, education, the use of uh, understatements. The use of uh, the, the subtle use of uh, of uh, words and terminology uh, to make you sound apparently uh, impartial and objective, without touching upon the vulnerable nerve of the CCP, as well as the very nationalistic and jingoistic Chinese people, uh, which is now getting worse now, right? So. Um, I, draw, I drew myself some lines, but not out of self-censorship, but out of the art of, uh, of uh, sarcasm, 
or the art of expressing uh, expressing things in a witty in a witty and humorous way as a bit of a challenge to myself, and to see how I could survive in um, in a post nineteen ninety seven. Beijing directly or indirectly ruled Hong Kong,、okay. and surprisingly,、uh, I was okay. I got away with many things, and、uh, some people from Beijing were willing apparently to make friends with me. And they said, "Oh, they read my columns. They wouldn't agree on everything I said, and they think, 'Oh, you are a little bit deliberately or provocative funny.' However,、uh, we still consider." You a patriot, not quite a compliment, you know.、Um, so I managed. I just managed to survive. And as I read, I started reading many report, reports and stories、um, written by、uh, journalists and reporters from some third world countries, you know. And、uh, these reports kept、uh, ringing the alarm for me, and I felt myself so fortunate, right, because of my earlier. A literary education in this country, and an English degree had、uh, molded me into a a Cantonese verse, a Cantonese version of a of a, a bit of mixture of George Orwell, Oscar Wilde, and again, you know, some familiar names. Let me push back <laughs> on one of the points you made a little bit,、uh, where you said that you started sort of. Cutting and shaping the kind、yes. of commentary you were doing in order to make sure it was always below that red line.、Yes. Um, it's not an experience unique to China. It's happening in many parts of the world、yes. now. Satirists,、yes. uh, stand-up comics get cancelled for content.、Right. Uh, they, there are more and more no no go、uh, zones than there are go zones, and in essence, satire is. It is political, is、yes. it not? It is meant to throw,、uh, you know,、um, a very, very clear line at something that is wrong.、Exactly. It is meant to do that in a way that many other aspects of art cannot do.、Uh, did you feel restricted by it? Do you think those restrictions are making it more and more difficult to actually practice the kind of satire we saw? Well, it all depends on different cultures, and whether your satire or or or, or fun or. Or fun making, or humor, or humor, sense of humor,、uh, fall into、uh, sensible or understanding ears. From time to time, I make trouble. You know, I like to、uh, share a very not a very good piece of my my satirical column, written in two thousand and nine. You know, later with you, but satire, as defined by the Cambridge Dictionary of English, as a humorous way of criticizing people, or Ideas to show that they are wrong、uh, is an a, a, a satire when applied to a, a commentary. You know, is、uh, an entertaining form of social and political commentary. But satire, what must come with one thing, I think, which is the magic of、uh, English humor, self mockery. You mustn't keep on making fun on other people. You got to look at the mirror by yourself. And、uh, you got to admit that, you know, you yourself are a little bit silly, you know, in all aspects of life. So, so long as you make fun of yourself first, from time to time, not a must every time, you know, <laughs> you downgrade yourself a little bit, you know, and that is the、um, uh, condition for or admission for you,、uh, admission ticket. For you to make fun of other people, so long as these as these criticism are again based on facts. So a good, I mean, there's also a saying: satire is the lowest class of wit. You know, you don't always go for the opposite, right? In、uh, in、uh, describing what you what you see, you know. Well, I mean, you don't you don't call a black、uh, someone black a white or white or black. You know, beautiful exchange.、Uh, Uh, adjectives like、uh, pretty and ugly, that sort of things. So there are some universal rules of writing that would apply. I think not only to English, but to Chinese, but all other foreign languages. Use、um, short sentences. Go easy with your vocabulary, and、uh, when you write the commentary, try to avoid you, the use of adjectives as much as possible. Don't use so many adjectives. I mean, like oh, horrendous. That's what academia is. Ugly, <laughs> terrible. You know, 
uh, uh, labeling, you know, yeah. all sort of labeling. Oh, he's what a misogynist, you know, sexist or racist, as well as uh, uh, um, uh, um, strong opinionated adjectives, right? So try to present your your views with facts and uh, with as much objectivity as possible, with a tight upper lip, with an inscrutable uh, stone face, you know, you make your point and uh, make people laugh, right? This is typical of the Mr. Bean, Rowan Atkinson, and so many other great uh, British comedians like uh, Peter Seller, Peter Ostinov, you name it, even Charlie Chaplin, right? In 2009, uh, you wrote an article about the Sino-Philippine yes. dispute. That's right. Any lessons to draw from there? And any lessons to share to those who work in the area of satire? I have been invited by the editor, an American editor of the Hong Kong uh, we, uh, magazine, you know, which was a weekly uh, affiliated to the uh, South China Morning Post later, right? Uh, because um, the stereotype is um, uh, not many Chinese people are seen uh, humorous, you know. In the rest of the world, they tend to be, they tend to look serious, solemn, you know, and uh, and um, and uh, straightforward, right? So it was a bit of a challenge to me. So I thought, well, why not? So at that time, you know, uh, still now, China and the Philippines have some uh, territorial disputes over the Spratly Islands, right? And the Hong Kong is sandwiched between China and the Philippines in a way that so many Hong Kong housewives, including myself, are employers of uh, Indonesian, Thai, and Filipino domestic helpers. Right? And uh, that, that kind of political rows between the two countries, I always wondered uh, uh, what kind of implication to, uh, what kind of implications uh, the, those uh, Filipino domestic helpers uh, have? Because some of them, or even most of them, are were or are graduates from universities. You know, they are not there just to do domestic and kitchen work. They have families in the Philippines. Uh, they have uh, they they have the husband or some some of them even children, but they are more or less seen in a stereotype as. Uh, Domestic, uh, uh, domestic working machine. In my eyes, you know, it's de facto more than slavery. Not very fair. And some of the human rights are brutally, or I mean, are ruthlessly taken off. Taken off. For example, if they get pregnant, you know, they get the sack. And uh, we never question a single woman Filipino uh, domestic helper at the age of twenty-eight. You know whether she's happy, whether she's happy with her single life, getting herself confined in the servant's room, you know, in the, in the tiny servant's room in our flats, working round the clock for years and years. Hong Kong employers and parents never bothered about that. You know? So I didn't feel very comfortable. Right? I, was, um, I was deeply sympathetic with the... Uh, with the plight of the domestic helpers uh, predicaments in Hong Kong, you know, but um, not many Hong Kong people, you know, of my age uh, or, or from my peers understand or, or wish to know uh, to, to listen to or understand what I was trying to say because while well, Hong Kong was enjoying the, uh, the golden bubbling uh, years of China's GDP growth, you know, under Jiang Zemin. So I decided to write that piece. Um, assuming a uh, presuming a scenario that uh, I got myself into a the kind of bullying uh, uh, um, uh, situation by uh, asking my Filipino domestic worker whether she would accept that a part of her motherland, a part of her country, belongs to us. You know, so I mean, it's with hindsight, it was a bit silly. You know, it was the kind of crude um, satire with uh, some Cantonese cultural characteristics. Right? In Cantonese, we do uh, express our humor somehow in that way. And mind you, Cantonese is a very cynical and humorous uh, language, but somehow, you know, too graphically 
uh, blatant, you know, uh, different from uh, English, right? So it was a, a bit of a, 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 an experimental a combination of uh, Cantonese humor and uh, English satire. And um, when after it was published, I didn't know that there was a, a Filipino a parliamentary election that was going on, right? And uh, wow, I mean, it opened a can of uh, uh, worms right away, you know. And uh, uh, the Filipino uh, Domestic Workers Association in Hong Kong was um, uh, very uh, 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 was very angry, and as well as the consulate. Uh, of the Philippines in Hong Kong. You know, at that time, the chief executive of Hong Kong, uh, the governor, Don Lo Jiang, you know, a personal friend of mine, he wouldn't even grab the phone and call me, hey, Chip, what, what the hell is going on? You know, what have you written? You know, it was something new for the uh, chief executive and the Hong Kong SAL government. They didn't know what to do. So, I mean, there was uh, about 6,000 uh, workers took to, uh, who took to the street in central and uh, holding banners you know calling me a racist or or imperialist or whatever you know? so I went to the consulate and offered my uh, apology mm -hmm. right? and then it died down a couple of weeks uh, later the Filipino government sent their tourism board official to Hong Kong privately and said you know well, we have uh, read your article. We've accepted your apology. We believe that it was there was some cultural misunderstanding involved. Don't worry, you know. Rumor has it that you are uh, you are uh, you are banned from uh, entering the Philippines. That is not true. We sincerely invite you for a a, a fortnight long uh, uh, a private tour to Manila and other parts of the Philippines to help you to understand our country. Uh, Did you go? I did, I did. I said, uh, thank you very much. I mean, uh, thank you very much for your understanding and um, for your great pardon, you know. Uh, do convey my uh, gratitude to your uh, president. I would uh, take a chance in the near future to go there by myself. Right. Speaking of elections, I don't know if anyone's noticed what's coming up in this year, which is uh, an election everywhere you look. Yes. Um, it's vulnerable because what you write yeah. could be uh, exploited or made use of by other parties somewhere, you know, lurking invisibly in the world. You never know. We live in a globally uh, well-connected yes. you know, world of in information, you know. Can so we are in a more vulnerable position than perhaps 20 years ago. Yes. The question I was going to ask was, can it be vulnerable but also powerful we saw something like that and we are seeing something like that in the u.s where late night comedy has really taken on a role in itself um you know many faces there like john yes. stewart etc are probably causing more by way of change or impact or drawing attention to certain issues than journalists are yes is there power in satire particularly in an election year or mm. is it as you say something that can expose vulnerabilities? Can it be a tinderbox situation? Yes. Uh, we live in, a, in the world of um, social media, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, or TikTok, or even worse, AI, chat GDP, etc. Well before we are aware, one danger at one stage, another new danger has already uh, arisen and uh, the world would get into a new stage. So as journalists or reporters, I think we have to be uh, uh, quick to respond to uh, such uh, ever-changing technological uh, challenges, uh, to be aware of uh, the change of mindset of the audience or readers, especially from the young uh, uh, generation. Right? And we have to keep ourselves constantly informed of what's, what, what happens uh, in the rest of, our, of the world, such as um, the recent um, a conflict between the, uh, Israel and uh, Gaza, right? And how nationalism and hate or blind um, animosity uh, was developed out of the cyber world, especially, you know, if there is an invisible hand behind manipulating 
and um, releasing fake news and whatever, you know, stirring up the already muddy water and making different peoples uh, hate each other more. So there's always another war going on, right? And that war has begun, and uh, I don't see any chance of it. It's going to stop, of it stopping in the near future. Right. So as far as uh, journalism is concerned, I think yeah. we better get three levels you know, very clear. Reporting, analysis, and commentary. As far as reporting is concerned, uh, we stick to the old rules of uh, presenting, uh, faithfully presenting facts and checking accurately all the evidence and basic facts, uh, uh, basic um, um, uh, truths like what, when, who, when, where, how, you know, the old, the old rules. You know, arrangement and materials and narrative in, the object, uh, in an objective way and, um, and uh, avoid your own subjective comment or just stay invisible as a journalist. And the second level is analysis, telling your reader the causes and the possible consequences of your new story. You know, uh, from an objective angle with the knowledge of the journalism. And it is from that level if things get a little bit dangerous because um, you are not only reporting what happened, you are telling the readers why and how it happened, right? So your reporting or your words could touch upon uh, a few nerves of the authorities or of a dictatorship lurking somewhere, you know. You are refreshing reader's memory and arousing reader's further interest in the background, context, and possible uh, uh, further development of the new story uh, or where it happened. So the third level is commentary. You know, it's just like editorial in The Guardian or The Sun or Mirror. Uh, it's the expression of the views of the journalist, uh, his concerns and perhaps anxiety uh, framed in a vision of insight with a moral light telling what the journalist thinks is right and wrong. Now, when you get to the level and if you become a so-called celebrity, you're more or less on dangerous waters because you become influential. People will listen to you, you know, and you are a, so you are branded as so-called an opinion leader, right? And now, you know, it's worse, you know, that term, it makes me laugh from time to time, KOL, key opinion leaders. Once you're called the key opinion leader in China, you know, it's not a very complimentary and a flattering uh, <laughs> a title because there's only one key opinion leader who resides in his imperial palace in Beijing. One man with his lone voice. And how come there, uh, there is an alternative key opinion leader somewhere in Hong Kong, whatever, whatever, you know? So you're inviting troubles. So in this kind of, under this sort of atmosphere, I have to take um, up more precautions. I remember an, a veteran, a former friend of mine, also a former boss, Louis Cha, who was also a, uh, an honorary doctor from uh, St. Anthony's College of Oxford. He warned me when he was alive. He was a great martial arts novelist, as well as a proprietor of the only liberal newspaper in Hong Kong, Ming Pao, right? He told me, look, Chip, survival is of prime importance for a journalist. It doesn't serve you any good if you, if you dare speak up the truth and get yourself locked up for 15 years or even face the firing squad. You must survive to see the end of a tyranny. So you've got to protect yourself. It's just like the weather. You know? When it gets cold, wear a few more jumpers and jackets. When it gets hot, when climate turns to summer, take off your jackets and wear T-shirts. And you remain yourself all the time. You know, what you wear changes. But you, your heart and soul and your principles and your bottom line remain unchanged. That's Louis Cha. And he later in, uh, got involved in Hong Kong politics. And um, he was attacked by uh, some radical Democrats in Hong Kong of uh, betraying the interests of 
of Hong Kong and kowtow into China. Knowing him, I know it isn't true because his father was executed as a landlord in 1990, in 1950 uh, by, the, um, uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. And he had been bearing that grudge, resentment, and he had been swallowing that pain throughout his life. You know? mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that's journalism. Yes. With all the challenges, opportunities, and good fun today. I am going to pause there, and it's a great segue because you're absolutely right. It's about satire and journalism and also the public policy community. So let me turn to two practicing journalists and get their thoughts in on how satire can sometimes be a very powerful weapon, but uh, at sometimes it might present the problem yes. that you alluded to. Olga Takaruk is part of the Reuters community. She's a former fellow from the Reuters Institute. And much of her work while she was with us focused on how satire was used in a very powerful fashion in uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Olga is from Ukraine. Olga, I'd love for you to share your observations first. Thank you, Mikhail. And thank you for an excellent uh, talk and so many insights. Um, yes, my, my project for the Reuters Institute focused on uh, the use uh, of humor by Ukraine to counter Russian disinformation and also in strategic communications. And uh, Ukraine's case is very particular in a way that uh, the, the primary goal of Russian disinformation directed to Ukraine is to de deny Ukraine's agency, to somehow convince uh, people in other countries that Ukraine is not a real country, that it doesn't have a right to exist, that Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian language are somehow artificial constructs and therefore uh, need to be, Ukrainians need to be re-educated or Russians should be reinstated there. And in this uh, context, how Ukrainians used uh, uh, what they did to counter this disinformation, they actually, their main goal was to, um, to state the opposite, that no, we do have agency, we do have culture, we do have language, we do have our, our country is a sovereign country that has a right to exist. And they used humor heavily uh, since the start of Russian full-scale invasion, which might seem unlikely in the context of war. Why would you use humor? It might seem really absurd and illogical, but it made sense because uh, by using humor, Ukrainians also showed their resilience and their resistance. So it, it helped uh, uh, the, 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 why, uh, 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 like, what what the Ukraine's use of humor uh, did? Um, it worked for the internal audience to foster unity and resilience within, within and inside the country, and also on the international arena, it helped to mobilize support for Ukraine and just to help people in other countries to discover Ukraine actually and to see it as a country and as people who do have agency, who are different from Russia, who are a separate nation with their own culture, language, and their own willingness to define their, their past. And in the case of Ukraine, uh, it's very uh, interesting that the use of humor was decentralized. So uh, both the government used it in its communication, and it's very interesting also how on the level of diplomats and officials, the humor was used. Uh, that in President Zelensky, in many of his speeches, uh, he used jokes. Well, obviously, he's a former comedian, so nothing too, uh, you know, um, surprising about that. Uh, but also remarkably, how many uh, just ordinary users online used humor, created memes uh, to um, demonstrate their resistance, their resilience, and to just get the message across about Ukrainian cause to the wider audience. So what humor did in Ukraine's case, it helped Ukraine to reach wider audience in um, even among people in other countries who didn't really know much about Ukraine, who didn't really care about Ukraine. But when they uh, saw a funny meme or they saw images of, uh, I don't know, a Ukrainian and then the memes that were created of a Ukrainian uh, tractor pulling a Russian tank in the, the very first, you know, weeks and, and days of the invasion and a lot of memes that it generated, uh, that helped people to relate somehow more to this country and to appreciate, you know, well, how these people are able under this situation of horror and Russian bombardment in the situation of an external aggression, they are still able to make jokes, they are still able to make memes, they are still able to somehow withstand and survive. So it helped many people in other countries who maybe knew little about Ukraine to discover Ukraine and to understand what Ukraine is and to discover also humor as a part of Ukrainian national character in a way. Um, and, and also, in terms of disinformation, humor and satire, they really help to expose the absurdity of Russian propaganda and disinformation, because Ukrainians were somehow uh, making uh, uh, this, uh, 
basically saying, repeating what Russians were saying, but repeating it on steroids so that it would become obvious how ridiculous these claims were, just how absurd they were. And in that sense, it really helped to combat this information much better than all debunking or fact-checking initiatives. And of course, humor is just one tool. It is not the only tool when it comes to this information. And uh, as the same amount of people in your poll argued that it doesn't really help you because it might draw the attention to the information. But in the case of Ukraine, as I said, it, 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 because both Russian disinformation and Ukrainian attempts to counter it are about agency. And that's why I think it worked in this case. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Olga. Um, Satire and war was not a combination I think people had looked at and, you know, you walked us through how that, that came to be. The other one I think people haven't looked at are satire and investigation. John Allen Namu is an outstanding investigative journalist. A lot of his work has been broadcast worldwide. Is that a combination that works, John? I mean, satire and corruption, satire and sociopolitical situations, all of it we understand. Can it be used in a powerful manner for investigative pieces? Well, for sure. I think, um, and I mean, just to to locate Kenya in, in, in this context, I think Kenya has a long history of the use of satire, both um, within the context of journalism, but also just socially. Um, in terms of investigative reporting, um, there's been a lot of use of satire. Just just like, uh, like, like, like Olga has mentioned, um, the public consuming investigative reporting and then turning some of the, con the, some of the content from investigative reports into memes and, and what have you online. I think Kenya has a very, very strong um, sort of current history from on, on that. Um, and, and, and I think most powerfully, um, aside from the demonstration of, of, um, of agency, it, it's really become almost like a fourth language for, for a lot of populations across the world in terms of expressing either their discontent um, with um, the state of affairs or being able to speak to people who are in positions of power that they'd never be able to sit across from um, the, the way I'm seated across from you. Um, you know, in, in, in Kenya, there's, there's an author uh, named uh, Yvonne War, and she, she authored this book called Dust. And in it, she says that uh, Kenya has three official languages, um, English, Swahili, and silence. And, and I'd say the fourth language is humor. Um, and, and, and in humor, what you find, especially with this younger generation of, uh, of Kenyans, is a bravery um, that, that you haven't really seen in the past um, because it, it's now almost democratized, right? A bravery in addressing people directly. You know, they'll tag the president and, and you know, give him a nickname and, and that becomes popular. They'll tag uh, leaders and, and give them nicknames or, or tag them on memes, et cetera. And you see that transference into um, regular or legacy journalism via the kinds of la the kind of language that's also used by journalists uh, to be able to express or speak in the language of the public. So I think there's there's a lot of cross pollination there between what happens in 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 the field of humor with the public and what is expressed through journalism. Um, I'd say. That are kind of owns like two sides of the of, of the same coin, right? So where journalism is more hard eyed, it's it's more it's more factual and and you know on the nose in a sense. Uh, humor uses more indirect um, language and and more more indirect content to be able to express some of the same points. The Pandora Papers um, was a great example of that. Yeah. Um, when President Uhuru Kenyatta mm -hmm. and and the family members were named, um, you know uh, the the hashtag online wasn't Uhuru Kenyatta, it was um, <clears throat> Client1373, which was, you know, the, the name that, <clears throat> that he went by in the, in the Guardian investigation and in other investigations around um, the Pandora Papers. And that was then turned into satire and turned into humor. Yeah. Can I ask you both briefly before I open up to questions for Chip, though? Um, would you say the biggest threat to satire remains governments? For many cartoonists, the state of play at this point across the world is that they expect zero understanding from yes. the political community and only some support, perhaps, from the legal uh, you know, community in the courts. What if, Olga, the joke was on Ukrainian misgovernance? Would there be as much capacity to take it on the chin and say, that was funny? Well... 
Definitely. Ukraine is a democracy. You know, Ukraine it does have its internal problems, but there is still freedom of speech. And the government is used to being criticized, and the government has to react to the criticism in the media. And, and satire is a form that criticism. So actually, the main threat to journalism in Ukraine is Russian invasion. John, same question to you. I'd say that the main threat to... Are you saying the main threat to satire? Yes. So I'd say there's maybe one or two ways of looking at it. So the, the main threat to satire obviously is, is power that is expressed in a very naked and, and, and ambitious and, and violent fashion. Um, and that's the tradition. But in context of freedom of speech and, and the proliferation of the internet, I'd say another threat is, is political correctness itself, mm -hmm. right? So because, you know, with the new sort of interactions that we're having with one another and the redrawing of, of lines of who who is who and, and identity, then people are trying to be able to establish themselves, their own identities, et cetera. And that becomes a sore spot for communities who are trying to build their own, you know, their own um, identity, right? And, and political correctness often demands that you kind of treat um, these, new, these new communities with, with kid gloves in a sense. And they are no, and they, they often take it. They, they often take it very, fairly badly that they'd be the butt of a joke, right? So I'd say it's those two things. But on the one hand, I agree that that um, you know political correctness sometimes can stand in the way of having like a, a really honest and sometimes humorous conversation. But on, on the other hand, it can be taken too far. Um, so it's it's. It's it's that I think it's it's um, the expression of power in in a very naked way. The, then there's the pol the misuse of political correctness and and um, yeah, I think it would be those two. Yeah. Thank you both very much. I'm going to now open this up to the room. Uh, we're going old style, which is raise your hands, and I will point out to you. Hopefully, we can get a mic to you, and you can direct your question to Chip. Shall we start there with Omar, and then we'll come to you. Is there a mic reaching Omar, or shall I just ask him to request him to start? The room is my yeah, voice. But I people online okay. may not be able to hear you. Okay, thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, I have uh, one or two questions. Uh, the first question is, how is your strategy to avoid uh, satire fatigue? Because uh, when you repeat something like, almost all the time, when it's new, everybody runs to it. Then when it goes through the time, uh, it becomes kind of, you know, uh, people are developing kind of avoidance. How is your strategy to avoid that? And also, uh, what do you say to people that think that using satire to tackle political issues is kind of de-dramatizing those political issues? And last question, can it survive in a poorly educated country? Um, that's a lot of questions. Uh, when anyone who's online and didn't hear that, let me just do a very quick run through. One is around satire fatigue. The second question is about de-dramatizing what are actually extremely serious political occurrences. And the third one is, is this ineffective for a poorly educated community, in other words, is satire in itself quite elite in nature? Chip, would you like to do that? Yeah. I mean, generally, there are two types of satire. Uh, the first is uh, what I uh, would call raw and naked satire, uh, taking the hepto, uh, the hepto uh, uh, caricature yes. uh, more than a decade ago. Uh, they deliberately or you know, blatantly uh, drew a caricature of Mohammed with a big turbine and uh, with a turban with uh, uh, some explosive uh, bomb hidden in it, you know, and seen by the readers. Now, these were very radical for uh, uh, Muslim people from the Ar from an Arab Arabic cultural background would find it extremely, extremely provocative, and that I would say that would put those uh, respectable French uh, artists in a very difficult uh, situation, you know. Uh, that is an example of raw and naked sarcasm. And the other one is the most famous ending line of um, the animal farm, right? Those creatures outside looked at each other from man to pig, 
from pig to man and from man to pig again, and it was impossible. To, it was not. It was. It became impossible to tell which was which. Now the juxtaposition of man and pig, so blatantly, would sound a little bit too straightforward and provocative. But these raw, these examples of raw or naked sarcasm would appeal to the mass and very forceful, very powerful. You know, and you could use once or twice. You know, very. Um, uh, I would say, you know, daringly. But depending on the change of political climate, if the employment of such examples of satire immediately incurred very angry response from the social media or internet with an overwhelming volume or amount of name calling or, or hate or even threat against your life, and then you would have tested the temperature and would refrain from using that again you know, for your own sake of safe, uh, for your own safety. Now the other satire, the other kind of satire is I would say a more subtle kind or more sophisticated kind, without naming, without you know using words like pigs and dogs or whatever, you know. For example, the Chinese people are now getting extremely nationalistic and jingoistic among themselves as for their hate against Japan. You know, there was an earthquake. Uh, there was an earthquake in Tokyo, followed by a few, you know, uh, uh, attacks right in Japan. You know, and uh, all the uh, Chinese social media boiled up and applauding. You know that uh, those um, sufferings, you know, by the Japanese people, and think that it was their karma. Right? You know, so in an atmosphere like this, how would you, how would you play with your satire, right? You know, and uh, I would use, I would say something like this. You know, Chip Chow, right, as a, you know, a, a journalist or. or or columnist or broadcaster or whatever. I've been working in journalism, in, in broadcasting and uh, writing for years, but uh, I feel no sense of achievement. My greatest achievement has always been, I am always mistaken as a Japanese in Europe, America, or even in Japan. Now, so many things remain unsaid. <laughs> that means, you are mistaken as a, as as a Japanese rather than a Chinese. There are so many implications. That means you don't go noisy when you talk or speak to your friends in the public. You know, um, uh, you look elegant. You have the right dress code. You are always polite and quiet while checking into a hotel. You know, in Tokyo and Osaka, mm -hmm. and somehow I deliberately, I I came back from. Uh, from uh, uh, Kyoto, you know, about two weeks ago, when I was in Japan, it was half being pretentious, half being, uh, you know, really typical. I always took a, an English book or somehow a French book with me, walking into a Japanese cafe and put it down and read the menu, you know, right? <laughs> and dress like something like this, not in, a, not in luxury, <laughs> right? And I got very, you know, excessively friendly treatment from uh, my Japanese surrounding. So, so many things remain uns unsaid, but it is rather, it's provocative enough. It's anti-nationalistic. You know, I even risk uh, uh, the crime of uh, treason, really, if enough people can read between the lines. You know? Uh, but without underlining things, without calling a spade a spade. So you employ different tactics of satire from time to time. Just be creative. It's, it's, it's good fun. You know? I'm sure when George Orwell, George Orwell used to be a journalist and as well as a writer. And he, also, he was also a colonial police officer stationed in Burma. He has seen enough of the world. He had uh, been in touch with uh, different cultures. Well, that's why he was such a prolific and such an interesting, one of the greatest English writers of the 20th century. I'm going to try and move it along because I know there's more questions. Uh, the gentleman at the back first, and then we'll come to you. Please go ahead. 
Yes, you. Uh, yes, you. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Duncan Hewitt. I'm actually an old colleague of CHIPS and used to work for the BBC in China. Um, so I was interested in John's point uh, that in Kenya, you've seen a sort of rise in the courage of people to use satire, I guess, online in particular. Um, and we saw something very similar in China for about 15, 15 or more years uh, and, until about 10 years ago um, when, you know, I think the current key opinion leader, as Chip described him in Beijing, uh, you know, very much is opposed to, to humour of any kind and, and satire for sure. And so in what's happened in Hong Kong since 2020, when China introduced that very tough national security law, I mean, is satire dead in Hong Kong? And can people like you outside Hong Kong still keep it alive? Yeah. Yes, to use that by the way, Chip, in discussions at home. As key opinion leader, I decide. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Please go ahead. Yes, it's more or less, um, you know, Tai Da, a good friend of mine who's uh, a caricature artist, you know, Chen Zi, who has been working for Ming Pao for more than 30 years. He had been threatened by the uh, police chief in Hong Kong uh, about uh, his, uh, his uh, daily uh, uh, cartoon, you know against uh, not well uh, against the police and uh, against the uh, the uh, current uh, SAL uh, Hong Kong government you know and he was threatened uh, uh, to be sued or taken to court uh, uh, by the uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, national security law and he was he is a very brave man I know him so well you know a very talented uh, uh, caricature and cartoonist you know. Uh, but his uh, newspaper, Ming Pao, uh, got a little bit scared and they asked him uh, to, um, to terminate his daily cartoons. You know. What made me angry is Jun Zi, a good, friend, a good friend of mine, has uh, so much, uh, so many artistic talents. He could be, he could be uh, hired or recruited as an illustrator for children's books or for textbooks, you know, there are many publishers in Hong Kong. They could easily offer him a job, but instead, you know, nobody would, but they think, you know, he was, he's treated as an untouchable because of his name, because of his familiar face, because Hong Kong is such a small place, everyone seems to know each other. So it is um, censorship coupled with uh, the kind of uh, uh, unnecessary fear and self-censorship from the Hong Kong people and the Hong Kong at least publishing industry and media themselves. So it's a, it's a boring place now. You know, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just like a Jerusalem 2,000 years ago without Jesus and uh, all the disciples. Uh, it was the uh, uh, omnipresent rule of the Roman Empire by the Emperor Tiberius, you know. But I'm not sure. But I'm sure it is going to be short lived. You know, things will change. It's, it can't go on like this. We all live in the 21st century. Come on, you know, uh, this is not uh, the world is no longer uh, uh, at the time of the Genghis Khan or or Emperor Qin or Caligula or Caligula or whatever. You know. So so long as you uh, can weaponize your humor and satire uh, creatively and smartly, I think. Or more or less, you can survive, and I hope so. I think. Uh, well, there, I'm sure there's humor in all cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard some. Uh, I've heard some really brilliant Russian jokes during the Soviet Union time. You know, uh, against uh, uh, Khrushchev and the Soviet Union Communist Party, they were great stuff. And also, they are great humorists and um, and uh, joke tellers. You know, in China, right? Their punchlines, you know, keep coming out. Uh, through the uh, Chinese internet, you know, they're brilliant works, right? So I hope uh, uh, one day, you know, when the, the climate changes or the naked emperor is no more, uh, these great works would be uh, collected and could uh, get into print and become some uh, great documentation of a human history uh, to show to the future generations that some of us, you know, do fight, did fight hard uh, for the sake of uh, liberty and freedom. Right?
I think we can squeeze in one more question. The gentleman in the brown jacket, please. Yes, so uh, I was expecting something else, uh, some humorous type of uh, environment uh, inside the room. Who want to create journalists and public policy? Yeah. I'm sorry, couldn't get fun here. You go and make fun while listening your lecture, and we want to understand the subject in a different way than usually we understand the subject matter. So, in this context, I would like to ask one one question, only one question: How do you describe or hit corruption prevalence in the world in satirical language? How do you describe? How do you describe attacking corruption in a satirical way? Define corruption prevalence in the world in satirical language. In the, in the fourth language, <laughs> Zod has already been mentioned that this is fourth language. But in the best uh, uh, case study is Animal Farm. It's all about a, a piece of satire. It's a immaculate piece of satire of uh, political corruption. You know, when the two pigs. One called Napoleon, the other Snowball. First, the first leaders, you know, speaking up from for the underprivilege of the animals. Once they get uh, the power, become the ruling class, they abuse their power, right? So, Animal Farm is a like is a great it? piece uh, against corruption. I mean, there are different forms of corruption: uh, money embezzlement. Nepotism, you know, installment of uh, the president's uh, sister or whoever, you know, Kim Jong Un's, you know, now showing off his ten-year-old uh, daughter uh, blatantly uh, to uh, to the whole world, you know, uh, telling his people that uh, this ten-year-old girl is going to be uh, the next queen of uh, of North Korea, and different types of corruption, <laughs> right? So. Uh, you can, you may, what you can do is to dramatize each case, uh, and um, and um, knowing uh, knowing the roles of these uh, corrupt uh, corrupt government officials, you know who they are, and uh, where they have come from, you know, and uh, <coughs> and uh, what is the what is the case of the cor corruption like? How much money uh, does it involve? Is the money now uh, transferred to? Uh, uh, America, you know, or London, you know, a few luxury apartments uh, in High Park, right? So if that's the case, you know, get a piece of cartoon, you know, of a luxury flat at High Park, you know, with a view, you know, with this man, you know, right, hugging his uh, mistress or whatever, sipping a glass of champagne or whatever. I mean, this is uh, uh, typically, you know, a, a stereotype. Things like that, depending on different cases. And uh, tailor make and design and construct your satirical piece. I am afraid we are out of time, so we are going to hit pause here. But let me say a big thank you to Chip for being so engaging and so honest thank about you. both the flaws and the strengths of satire. Thank you to Olga. Thank you to John. Always a pleasure hearing both of you. I hope you enjoyed watching this and listening to this, and of course. Uh, it's only the start of our Global Journalism Seminar series that goes on through the next few months and it will now be online. But it's been fantastic having you here in person. A big round of applause, please. Thank you.